Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Back in June 2020, I introduced an interview with research paleoanthropologist, shamanic practitioner, and best selling author Dr. Hank Wesselman by reading an endorsement for his book, The Reenchantment, in which Dr. Ralph Metzner said, We are living in a time when the materialist world order and the human obsessions with manipulation, profit, and war have brought our civilization to the raw edge of global catastrophe. Into that perfect storm come voices that urge us to remember what we once knew, what shamans and Gnostics and the mystics of antiquity taught. Hank Wesselman is such a voice. On February the 15th, 2021, as the world was still struggling to navigate that perfect storm, Dr. Hank Wesselman left this planet. But his voice, his words, his memories of what we once knew, of what the shamans and Gnostics and the mystics of antiquity taught, lives on in his many best-selling books, videos, courses and recordings. Today, as we approach the first anniversary of Hank Wesselman's passing, I am joined by his wife and partner, Jill Kirkendall, for a special show dedicated to remembering and celebrating the life of a respected cutting edge scientist who became a spirit walker, a way shower, a weaver of worlds, a reshaper of realities, and a teacher whose legacy will live on for many years to come. Jill Kirkendall, welcome. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's so good to have you here, Jill. Ever since I heard of um, Hank's passing, I wanted to do something um, to mark the incredible legacy um, and presence, you know, uh, of this man that you were married to and loved and worked with. And, mm-hmm. you know, I never got to meet Hank in person, but I had mm-hmm. several very, very delightful exchanges with him in interviews over the years. And he always stood out for me as someone very, very special who I would love to meet and that mm-hmm. sadly didn't get the chance. So tonight is about remembering and celebrating Hank because, um, you know, he may be gone from us, but everything that he stood for, everything he created, everything he shared is still so valuable and so needed, mm. uh, especially at this time. Yes, I, I so agree. And I'm grateful for all that he bridged forward. Um, it's something about Hank, and I, I think what I can do for you and your listeners to speak about him a little more personally, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. And one of the things I've noticed about him the entire time I've known him, which was 45 plus years, is that he is by nature courageous. Mm-hmm. He leans in. I think his curiosity matched with a certain courageous capacity allowed him to go in many different directions and uh, explore and in doing so, he, he had his own hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell would say, and felt the responsibility of bringing back what it was that he experienced or discovered, acknowledging it as his own personal direct experience that might help inform other people's direct experience. Um, he was a man of great convictions, and he was also very stubborn. <laughs> And so part of, part of his um, legitimacy, I guess, in the world was his scientific background in which he could really name it and claim it as his uh, professional work in science. And he applied the same value system to his own direct experiences in the realms of consciousness. And because he would bridge it back and write about it, um, did not turn it into fiction or didn't turn it into 
uh, a church teaching or anything. He he allowed people to approach the information and make of it what they would. And I'm so proud of him for having done that. And um, so, yes, it's going to be nice to be able to remember him. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I'm always impressed and always love to support um, people who come from one particular background and then have experiences um, that expand their thinking, expand beyond, you know, their training. And um, and then they they kind of take a left turn somewhere and mm. turn into doing something completely different, which is yes. what Hank did. I mean, he had such an incredible background, you know, as a uh, with a doctoral degree in anthropology from the University of California at Berkeley. He served in the U.S. Peace Corps in the 1960s. He lived among people of the Yoruba tribe in Western Nigeria for two years. I mean, he did so much uh, incredible work. And then because of the experiences he started to have, he changed direction. And on your yes. website, somebody said something about um, he actually gave up what he really wanted to do to do something that he needed to do. Yes, and of course it's all factored in in terms of what he thought he was meant to do um, and wh where he thought he was going. It wasn't a complete giving up because with the achievement of his Ph.D. in physical anthropology, we're talking about uh, biological evolution, and his role in it was to help construct the uh, evolutionary landscapes that the fossils uh, of our most distant human ancestors were coming out of. And so if you study what else is going on in that stratigraphy at the same level, you can help create the larger picture. So he, he had an important role to play, and it had to do with focusing on the, the smaller mammals. Um, and yet, you know, he, he kept a certain poetic nature to it. He understood it at that level as well. But he also knew he had a family and he needed to have a job, and so he began applying for physical anthropology openings across the country. And yet it was the time in which affirmative action was the law. And so even if you were minimally qualified and not a white male, the law said you were to be hired. And he spent 15 years trying to get hired, and uh, it was painful. Uh, because he would get these letters of um, unfortunate news, no, you're not the one, from people who were department chairs of other universities and anthropology uh, departments, and they would be people he knew, and maybe even helped them get their PhDs back at UC Berkeley in the day. And so there was this real uh, sadness, you know, that that somebody that everybody liked was being denied an opportunity to anchor himself in that academic setting. And he was really made for academia, too. He loved teaching. He loved research. He loved colleagues. And he was not interested in the backstabbing side of academia. And to be not denied this, that he had spent the majority of his adult life focusing on, uh, at some point he had to give up the pursuit but isn't it interesting that it turned out that it freed him to be open to these other opportunities. Now, he did continue to teach as an adjunct in community colleges in the Sacramento area, which is, you know, uh, very consistent with a lot of what America is like. And so here was this interesting man standing up in front of uh, descendants of businessmen and ranchers and politicians in the Sacramento area and really capturing their attention. And more and more people began to be drawn to his classes, which were uh, called Magic, Witchcraft, and Religion, and being interested in what this very different kind of man had to say. And he loved it. He absolutely loved it. He, he didn't have an office, so they would follow him to the parking lot and hang out <laughs> with him at his car. Uh, he didn't have to do all the publishing and all the meetings. And he had a certain freedom in this adjunct position, 
which then, of course, led to him being able to go farther out into the world to various other institutions to teach specifically about shamanism. So you see how it all kinds, you know, it's like looking back on your own life going, God, that was a really painful, hellish time. But boy, I see how it made a huge difference in the long scheme, <laughs> you know, and that's what we were able to do eventually say, well, oh, thank goodness you were spared that academic position in which you would have been very locked in to lots of things that would have prevented you from writing these books, doing presentations, traveling and meeting with people. And so... There was a certain behind-the-scenes destiny guidance that yes. was going on, as hard as it yes. was. I mean, when you look at the fact that, you know, I mean, he was uh, conducting research in uh, the Africa's Great Rift Valley in search of answers to the mystery of human origins. Yes. And then you look at the work, you know, that he later went on to do, right. which actually really opened up that whole subject, I I would think further than anyone might have imagined. I mean, yes. there is there is something of destiny in that. Isn't that so? I mean, I would sit back and marvel and think, well, back in the 70s, you're out in Ethiopia with your colleagues, and then you're in places where fossils are being stored, and he got to hold the real fossils of the famous ancestor Lucy, the rest of us settle for the little plastic models that were made, <laughs> but he's holding the real bones. And I said to him, don't you think you got a little zap or two by doing that? <laughs> you know, he was in the right place at the right time for certain opportunities that, yes, they were special. He could have kept it to himself. He could have just thought more of himself and not cared. But he realized, you know, whatever has contributed to redirecting him is meant to be shared. And I'm uh, so proud of him that, you know, he was able yes. to take that step. And it, there is a kind of compromising of opportunity uh, on maybe one avenue of your career. Uh, when he wrote Spirit Walker, that was mm -hmm. a huge trajectory change. Yes. And what was his scientific colleagues going to think? Uh, many of them avoided that by just simply not reading the book. But they were aware of it. And they called it the green book. <laughs> 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 and yet, behind the scenes, many of them, some of his elders, in fact, would come to him and say, I've been studying UFOs for 30 years. <laughs> yeah. You know, they had their own mystical experiences that now they know who to tell. And it was very validating for Hank to know that some of the most revered scientists, names written in the stars, uh, were having similar experiences. And they, too, were having to walk a very fine line between the direct experience and then what their career was leading them. And, you know, in essence, since he wasn't hired, there was really nothing to lose. So Hank said, you know, I'm just going to keep putting this out there. And slowly but slowly... Some of his contemporary colleagues began to have similar kind of awarenesses or woke up to their own intuition. And I think in some ways that makes you a better scientist. You know, it's 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 quite sad. I mean, it's an indictment, isn't it, of academia mm. that that, you know, this is the, the whole point is to find answers. And yet. Of course. They only want to look in certain directions. They don't want to look at other answers, other possibilities. And, uh, of course, we can't say all of them are like that. But when you realize that it's so much about funding, it's about mm. who's going to get funded, then you have to walk that narrow line and make sure that your credibility is maintained. And Hank was aware of that. He did not want to jeopardize uh, his his research director's reputation or the funding for their projects. And so he uh, was very, he was very discreet in, in the degree to which he made himself known throughout the scientific community. Um, but he was also interested in validating his experiences. And so once when he was contacted by Dr. Norm Don, who was at the University of Illinois in Chicago, who said, I think I know what's happening to you. I'd like to do some, some brain uh, research on you. Are you interested? Oh, yeah, Hank wanted that. <laughs> and so Dr. Don came to the Sacramento area, set up his portable lab 
in a hotel room. And Hank has written about this in one of his books and had Hank go into the shamanic state and recorded his brain waves. Now, it was only one level superficial electrodes so in order to do that. And they wanted to raise the funds to do deeper studies in Hank's brain. Unfortunately, Dr. Don um, was diagnosed with cancer and passed before they were able to do that. But Hank knew some point at some time this was going to occur because of our technology, the sophistication, and also things were going to become more mainstream, just like yoga became more mainstream after a while. The meditations and the changing consciousness states and so forth, there was going to be more study. And uh, Dr. Norm Don was actually traveling to South America and India using his equipment to measure the consciousness, or I should say, the brainwave activity uh, in high masters. And what he found with Hank was that it was very unusual, uh, but similar to these very profound practitioners in South America and India. And Dr. Don hadn't found that within anybody in the United States until he met Hank. So here Hank had this scientific paper that was published, and he would go to his meetings in the scientific community, and if anybody came up to him and said, you know, Hank, I think I've heard that you've got some very strange things going on for you, and he would just hand them a copy of the paper. (laughs) (laughs) Which, you know, is so Hank. It's like, I'm not going to worry about making you believe anything. Yeah. But yeah. you like data. I like data. Take a look yeah. at this. Yeah. Yeah. Charming. So, so uh, when did you meet Hank? How, where, when? Yeah. And what was it that attracted you to him? Well, let's see. We're going back now. But we were both in Berkeley, both attending the University of California there. I was dating a graduate student. In fact, I was an undergrad student in psychology, and I was dating a graduate student who happened to be the house sitter for Hank when he would be in Africa doing his research. So in visiting my guy, I would be in Hank's house with Hank's pets, (laughs) his uh, books and his records. It was back in the day of records, so I had this wonderful music selection it was a, a very beautiful environment with things that had, Hank had collected over the years. And so I got to know this guy through his stuff. <laughs> and yet I was putting my attention on the guy that I was dating. Eventually when Hank came back, he held a party to connect with people since he'd been gone for four months. And my boyfriend said, hey, uh, let's go. And I said, oh, that'd be nice to finally meet the man. And Now, I'm quite young, you know, and I'm 21, and Hank was 10 years older than me. And so when I walk into this party of, my goodness, graduate students and professors, I really dove deep into my shyness at the time. And so I did a lot of listening, and at one point, my boyfriend pointed out Hank, who was in the middle of a circle talking to people, and said, oh, that's Hank Wesselman. Now, in my rather limited, youthful mind, I had this really bizarre thought was, I know that guy. I really, really know that guy. Now, how is that possible? And I just let it go and followed my boyfriend uh, into the larger room where we chatted. And, And after that, there was this social circle, which met regularly, and Hank was part of it. He was in a relationship my boyfriend and I, and other people that I'd gotten to know. So we all knew each other fairly well. And Hank was somebody who really liked to ask questions. His entire life, he liked to ask questions. So I was charmed by the fact that he was interested enough to ask me some questions. And we got to know each other. And a couple years later, we were both in the same situation where we were breaking up from our respective relationships. And you go through your day and People pat you on the back and give you a hug, but really, who can understand? And so we realized we had something to share rather empathically, and why not get together for lunch or dinner and share a meal and talk about how we're doing? And, uh, you know, it was very comforting. And after a couple of months of meeting and, you know, bursting into tears and my mascara dripping down my face, (laughs) I wore much more makeup back then. I really looked at him, and I saw him, 
And I wiped that mascara off, and I thought, this is a great guy. I think I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> and we both started to find sharing each other's company was much broader in, in meaning. And, and after a while, we were hanging out. Uh, we got to where we had a conversation about, well, what is this about, you know? And we got very truthful, both he and I, did not want to get married. I had made that decision as a child for a variety of reasons that I just observed in the married couples of the day. And he, having already been married once for a long period of time, had said, not going to do that again. And when we confessed that to each other, it was like, ah, freedom. We can just relax. We can really get to know each other. We can do things together. You know, we can call upon each other. And yet we had our own places. We didn't live together. And we started traveling in the world together. And that will tell you just how compatible you are <laughs> with somebody is travel internationally and see how it goes. Um, and so we had this wonderful sense of being in the world, enjoying each other. But really, both of us were going to specialize in four-month affairs. after we had spent time with each other, of course. We were going to specialize in four-month affairs. And then something happened. And that was, I was pursuing uh, being admitted into a physical rehab program at different universities in the country. And I had been doing some pre-med classes that I didn't get my first round of university. And wouldn't you know that I got an acceptance My first acceptance was at UC, um, not UC, USC in Los Angeles. And that gave us pause because we were living in Berkeley. And I said, oh, well, at least I got in somewhere. That's good news. And then a couple days later, we left on a river trip, uh, the Usumacinta River on the border of southern Mexico and Guatemala. And it was sort of a harem scarum experience. It was an organized, you know, had leaders. There were other people we knew who were on it. But boy, oh boy, it was it was an interesting environment with poisonous snakes, uh, snakes and banditos in the forest. And uh, and it was the only way to get to certain Mayan ruins was with this river, which was a transportation system for the Mayans long ago. And that's what interested us were these Mayan sites. So there we were, focused in reality, day to day, and we come around the bend uh, on, you know, in our rafts, and here's this most gorgeous waterfall, multi-tiered, just stunning. And somebody commented, oh, my God, it looks like a wedding cake. And I said, yeah, this is a perfect place to propose marriage, isn't it? Well, I didn't realize, but Hank heard that. And it kind of hit him, like, what is she saying? (laughs) (laughs) And I wasn't really projecting anything on myself or him or any. And so we just took in the beauty and sat in the pools and had our lunch there, got back in our rafts, went down the river. And when the sun was setting, we found ourselves having to set up camp in a rather muddy, ugly, smelly (laughs) area of the river, which we'll just be here one night, we can do this. And as it got darker and darker... And we finally put the last peg in for the tent. He said, so are you wanting to get married? And then it hit me what he was talking about. And I said, let me visit that idea. I need a little time. And we slept and got in the boats the next day and cruised down along with the rest of everybody and I, I checked in, and I realized, yes, this is, this is somebody that I knew I would care about for the rest of my life, no matter what. And I knew life was better with him than without him. Mm-hmm. And yet, in my mind, I had a very strong argument for not getting married. And when I visited that, I said, let's reframe this. If this were a Broadway play and it only ran for three or four years, it would be considered a success. Bingo, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) And so at the end of the day, I said, yes, I would like to marry you. And, you know, rather than feeling like 
we've now claimed something that's burdensome and goes against everything we believed and felt. There was this sudden liberation. There was this freedom, and it was like, I cannot reconcile it with agreeing to get married. But there it was. It was undeniable, and there was joy and happiness, and I was going to be entering a medical profession. He was looking to enter a physical anthropology profession. This is excellent, grounded. This will be great. Although I had a fabulous intuition. And I realized that we had shifted and were much at the time, but now looking back, it was much more about agreeing to the nature of the destiny that was being laid out for us. And when we got home... When we got home from that three-week river trip, there was another college acceptance in the mail. And it was from UC San Francisco, right there in our community. And if that had come first, we'd probably say we're going to continue the way we are until we don't. But we had gone through the process of considering what the separation would have been and what that was bringing up. And we'd already found our way to a committed place. And so we didn't back off it. We didn't see it as, oh, this is the exit. You know, this is the escape plan. (laughs) I'll still be in the community. Oh, well, no. Mm -hmm. And six months later, we were married. Wow. Well, we're going to take a short break now, Jill. When I come back, I want to know what happened when everything changed, when Hank's interests, his experiences, and presumably yours too, Um, But we'll come back to that after the break. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with author, shaman, and teacher, Jill Kirkendall, who joins me today in a special show dedicated to remembering and celebrating her late husband, research paleoanthropologist, shamanic teacher, author, and mystic, Dr. Hank Wesselman, whose extensive body of work provides us with a valuable glimpse into the possible of humans. We'll be back with more after the break. The future of internet radio is here. Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Omtums Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On? And I have a question for you. Have you ever walked through a bookstore and known in your heart that you should have a book on one of those shelves, but don't know how to make it happen? Writing your story and getting your book into print may feel intimidating, but it's remarkably easy and satisfying when you have an experienced professional to guide you. So if you're still striving to connect with your muse, Find your authentic voice, formulate your ideas, present your message in compelling prose, publish your book and build your platform and profile. Just imagine what you could accomplish with 30 plus years of experience in writing, editing, publishing, judging, hosting and resonance marketing to guide you. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. If you know you have a book in you, but don't know how to get it out of your head and into the hands of those who are waiting to read it, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. 
It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Welcome back. Jill Kirkendall, you and Hank got married in 1979. What happened when things started to turn? Um, who who turned first? Who was having the experiences? <laughs> and how did the other one react to them? Well, I actually have a very well-developed uh, intuition and have grown to trust it all you know, my life, and it has helped me with my path. It sometimes confounded Hank because he was unclear as to how I knew what I knew. And, uh, and so I, I realized, gee, this person to me is obviously very intuitive and he's questioning, you know, the existence of his intuition. So when he began to have these experiences, I would tap my intuition as to what was going on. And a term you don't often hear in our Western society is the term and the experience of initiation and what it actually means. And we can have our outer world initiations for sure. Women can have uh, the built-in initiations of their biology taking them in and out of childbearing years. Uh, But when there are certain... personal expressions in life that are meant to be revealed, I do now see that the subtler realms, the spirits in the subtler realms, can step forward and initiate initiations. (laughs) So I, I know when Hank began to have these altered states that there was, um, trust in what was happening. Of course, when I first observed, uh, when he had his encounter with the guardian spirit while we were living in Berkeley, I was awake. It was about four in the morning and I observed his body go into a kind of um, tension pattern that you might think would be a stroke or a seizure. And I actually, with my medical background, wasn't sure which was which, but I was reaching for the telephone to call 911. And I got about an inch away from the phone when my intuition really came in strong and said, no, do not call. Let him complete this experience. And so I didn't. And he did complete it and softened. And his breathing was fine. His pulse was fine. You know, I checked other indicators. He seemed to have stable, become stable And then I became intensely sleepy. I couldn't stay awake one more minute, and I went into a deep sleep. Um, When he woke up, he he had memory of what he was dreaming, so to you know, as he would call it then. And so he told me what he dreamed, and my intuition came in and said, "This is more than a dream." So I knew to keep an eye on him. Being a scientist, he was strong-minded. And uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that he was not being overwhelmed or too challenged by these experiences. They didn't happen very often at first. And I just kept an eye on his psychological well-being. When, when we moved to Hawaii and we were doing various projects out here, that's when he connected with his future descendant, um, Nainoa, and those experiences were much more engaging, kept him in a dream state even longer than usual when he was awake. And there were changes going on uh, in terms of his behavior and his availability and what his interests were. But there was no way was he inappropriate with me or our children. Um, And he did keep to a schedule of teaching and spending time with the family. But he was different. There was a mm. deep preoccupation. And so I realized something is going on. And he didn't want to talk about it, but he did start painting and created incredible images, uh, visionary paintings is what I call them now, 
uh, during that time. And it really did help me get more of an understanding of the direction he was being drawn into. I could get him to talk about the paintings. Mm -hmm. There were certain things that were a little spooky, and so, you know, he, he needed to burn something every day on our burn pit. Well, usually you burn once a week, but he needed to burn every day. So as soon as I finished the newspaper, he would take it and go up to the burn pit and burn it. And I'd look outside, and the trail of smoke would be going up, and he'd be uh, gesturing towards the smoke and, and saying things and speaking back to the smoke. <laughs> and at the same time, my two-year-old is walking on the land with a chicken, talking to the chicken, and I'm going back and forth from one to the other and thinking, my goodness, what is going on here? So I realized I needed some you know, plans. He, he was in my family. If he needed to go through a crisis, then he's in my family going through a crisis. But mm. I needed to know at one point, do I bring in professional help, uh, make certain changes, move us to an area where there are more services. You know, I, that's how my thinking was as a physical therapist. So I had plan A and plan B. And here I was pregnant with a second child facing the possibility that my husband may become permanently destabilized. And now I'm looking to raise two children by myself. It, it had a part of it, you know, some people said it must have been so fun and interesting for you, Jill. And I go, no, not really. Mm, yeah. It was very challenging, and I was a bit alone in it because nobody within my immediate family would have understanding for this experience. But you did ultimately change your profession to soul retrieval and became a, a shamanic did, healer yourself. And I did, and uh, after a long time of, of working in physical rehab and I got to where I had a, a private practice and then I was in consulting in terms of independent living. But then um, I, I was able to move into the specific service of soul retrieval because it, I entered a kind of uh, confusing period when I was working in a hospital and I won't go into the full story, but it was as if I was initiated into perceiving something returning to the patients that were there when they started to make more of an effort to become uh, well again. Those gestures of I'm alive rather than I'm dying, I mm -hmm. would reinforce so that they could leave the hospital and return to a meaningful life. And I would see certain energetic returns to them. Now, when I described it to energy practitioners that were friends, they kind of helped me understand it, but it was really Hank who overheard me and said, you're doing a kind of soul retrieval and explained the process. And he said, because you know how to journey, you can do this accordingly with a focus of going in, creating the, the, the return, and bridging it back to the person. They don't necessarily need to be in a highly dependent state. So I thought, well, I'll try it with a few friends. And then the word spread, and before I knew it, I was having more requests for that work than for my consulting, and that was the change. I thought, well, I'll do it for a while, maybe, you know, <laughs> six six months, <laughs> and then I'll go back to something else. And it didn't stop. I mean, the requests kept coming. And so I did it for several years. Yeah. And you talked together and you wrote together. And in 1996, you met Halle, Halle Makua. Halle um, Makua. Yeah, yeah, who and must again, have had an enormous is, impact. It was. And there's some of it is the behind the scenes that people are not aware of in that there were times when I seemed to be the one going forward and getting the word out just in terms of sharing and, and talking about our story. And then something would connect and come back to Hank. Mm -hmm. So I took two hardbound copies of Spirit Walker with me to New Zealand when I was part of a conference on uh, sustainability and biculturalism. And I knew there's going to be a couple of people I'm going to give this book to. And one of them was a fellow who was an American with dual citizenship and very involved in the, in the Polynesian gatherings that were going on in, in the early 90s. And I gave him a copy of Spirit Walker, and he knew Makua. And so after he read it, he sent it to Makua, unbeknownst to me and Hank, and Makua 
read it and consulted his ancestors. And because of that, they pointed him in the direction of meeting us. He came to us when we came back for the first time after we moved away from Hawaii. Seven years later, we're back, and Hank is about to do a presentation when Makua walked into the room to listen. And from that, it was a profound connection because Makua could see exactly what it was that we were being initiated into and the role to be played. And he gave us profound guidance, not so much telling us what to do, but giving us information and experiences that allowed us to find our way in a, in a deeper way. He also helped to lift some of the cultural restrictions of you know, being born and raised in a Western culture and in the Western mindset. You might even go so far as to say colonialism, which is now being talked about more openly than it was back then. And so we began to understand these experiences that Hank was having as a way of broadening and opening things that are meant to be happening now and brought more attention and definition so people can find out who they really are and their role in this evolution of consciousness. And here's the thing, that kind of information for Hank was fascinating and he identified with it, but he was not part of the New Age community. <laughs> you know, he... He worked with it as the kind of disciplined person that he was mentally with his strong scientific background, and some of the subtler aspects didn't interest him, and other people can be interested in those things. But what he really wanted was the deep dive yes. into what has been companioning this physical reality all this time, and a tradition like the Hawaiian culture is very rich in their understanding. And he wanted to, Hank wanted to be of service uh, in, in approaching the, I guess, the larger weaving of consciousness that was happening at the time, and not just promoting his story and encouraging other people to trust big dreams. <laughs> so Makua was in our lives for several years, and we enhanced each other so much. And, it, you know, Hank was still doing scientific work. And Makua uh, was doing his work and consulting with various groups. But one conversation stands out, Sandy, and I hope you'll give me some time to tell this one. Um, okay. Makua was very interested in the destiny of souls and the creation of souls. And he said, you know, the real story of humanity is migration, and not just around our globe, but it's the migration of souls from here in the universe to there in the universe one level of reality to another level of reality. And Makua shared with us that he, his soul um, migrated to Earth, the planet, 18 and a half million years ago. Well, that's interesting. And Hank thought to himself and said, what was going on 18 and a half million years ago? Because that's his scientific field. And he realized that the very earliest fossil evidence of whales indicate that they were then present on the planet 18 and a half million years ago. And Makua was self-claimed a member of the whale clan that had migrated from the stars, star system Sirius. He was a water clan member, he was a whale clan member, all of them tucked into each other, and that his definition of who he was and his purpose was very much based on that. So when Hank discovered he migrated eight, 18 and a half million years ago and the first whales are evident, he realized that Makua had become ensouled as one of the early whales and had been coming in and out of the planetary evolution for 18 and a half million years ago. Well, Hank goes back to Africa. They're doing their geological survey the geologists point out a layer of sediment at 18 and a half million years. Hank goes in and, without disturbing the research, actually uh, extracts a stone from that level and puts it in the pocket, brings it back, brings it to Hawaii. We meet with Makua and said, Makua, I have a gift for you. 
And Hank presents this stone and said, this stone came out of the fossil beds and is dated 18 and a half million years ago. And Makua took the stone and looked at it, and then he kissed it. This is how these two men related. This is how they enriched each other's lives. It was remarkable. Um, and I'll be forever grateful for the guidance and the support. And my role in all of this, Makua saw me as an equal partner, that Hank could not do this alone. And in mm -hmm. fact, he would not have had these experiences if I hadn't been in relationship with him. That's really quite something <laughs> to hear. But Makula was very straightforward and said it required the, the synergy of the two of you to bring forward you know, these opportunities. And it's not about market share or having tens of thousands of people. It's just about a certain collection of folks who are totally ready and waiting for this kind of participation to occur. And it's still possible because of, of the writings that Hank did and the material he brought forth, and even his paintings, which I've now made available on a, a new website called sharedwisdompaintings.com. People can go and see them there, these visionary paintings, very much connected to the sacred sites in Hawaii that are in the dream world, in their energetic form, and then some of them have their archaeological sites as well. It's rich territory, and I know the influence of these images are kind of like portals, or they can bridge people into a deeper meditation. And they weren't out in the world until uh, I decided, no, we need to make this a continuation of the work that Hank bridged in. Absolutely. I was looking at them earlier and uh, they're mm. quite stunning, quite, mm -hmm. quite stunning. Um, yes, I was mentally picking the ones I want. <laughs> but, um, you know, what you said about uh, what uh, Makua said about Hank couldn't do this without you. I mean, mm. you know, I've seen lots of people's posts uh, who've said that um, absolutely, you know, you were pivotal in that work. You were, you know, the power behind the throne, so to speak, whatever, right. you know, that you were such um, such a, 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 an important force of that. But I think that is something that we have forgotten. I think that is so important. And really, this is what, you know, Sacred Union is all about, is that we yes. do it together. Yes. And Hank also realized the power of the circle and in getting into a circle with people. Um, and gosh, he learned so much from people who gathered with us. Um, he felt equally enriched, and it was a very joyous occasion for him to learn and grow in that way. Um, of course, a little more complicated with me because here I am in more of an everyday world dynamic with him, you know, with household issues, with family issues, and mm -hmm. we had to we had to navigate our way through approaching things. And so what we did was we carved out in the morning, you know, first thing of the day conversations. And this is where we could share the dream the night before or any insights that were coming to us or tell stories, you know, or discuss something where he would lean in with more of the scientific and then I would bring in maybe more of the humanities <laughs> discussion. We would read poetry to each other and acknowledge that we really couldn't do what we were doing without the other one. Now, that makes it a little awkward when you realize he's passed away. Yes. But life had changed already, and we were elders. And at one point when we were driving the very scenic Route 1 in California towards Esalen to teach about 10 years ago, we had a kind of conversation where I stopped and I said, Oh, my God, Hank, we're Mamo and Papo now. <laughs> <laughs> We're having old people conversations and, you know, it's like, slow down, don't drive so fast, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and we just laughed and laughed because we're entering another stage. And yet there was this joy of connection and, and, and love and comfort. And yet I had to let him be who he was, being 10 years older than me. You know, he passed at 79, and he loved his vitality, and it was a little mysterious. I, it's hard to imagine him being as old as he was, but yet at the same time, he was getting older, and various 
systems were starting to need more attention and more support yes. and ultimately failed. He did not die of COVID, but, um, you know, it was more of a, a pneumonia situation. And um, so without him, I am definitely living a different life. Um, in some ways, it's I have to address my own health issues because I've been living with a blood cancer since 2013. Mm -hmm. And that means my life is different. But yes. it's an incredible period of time to be connected to him and have him guide me. I have requested not too much interference because I know there's more growth and individuation for me now that he's passed. And incidentally, my mother passed about the same time. So these two people who had known me the longest in my life both left the plane, the earth plane. And not having them as points of reference means it's different. Yes. Uh, and and I, I do want to experience more growth and development. And now that I'm not, I'm not a living woman's daughter and I'm not a living man's wife. And that affords me the opportunity to do more of my inner work, my own inner growth, while at the same time completing some of this assignment that Makua pointed out to us. And that's why I've refreshed our website. That's why I've created the website for the paintings. Um, and there are some unpublished things that will probably come forward, not so much in a formal published way, but on our website, because I'd like to get as much out there as I possibly can during the time in which I'm still vital. Well, we only have about a minute or two left, Jill. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've looked at your website. You've got some wonderful things there. People can still do um, the trainings. Um, mm -hmm. You still have um, the wonderful six CD course, the Spirit Walker Teachings, Journeys for the Modern Mystic. You've got uh, a number of um, YouTube videos there on various different topics. You know, if you had to sum up Hank's legacy, and I can't even imagine how you would, <laughs> But um, <laughs> if you had to, you know, is in a very short uh, sentence, you know, what? how would you sum it up? Wow. Wow. Um, well, I would say this is a man who courageously said yes to everything that was presented to him as part of what he was meant to experience. And... That, I mean, even in changing his mind about getting married, and we weren't going to have children, and changing his mind about having children, and each of these became initiatory, punctuated points in which he said yes to becoming more of who he really was and sharing that with others so they can do it too. Um, so knowing that he was wanting to get back to that and continue doing it, uh, he never said no. Something had to interfere. That meant it's enough. It's time to go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think on the website it says, uh, and I think you said this, he passed knowing humankind's true destiny is to mm -hmm. discover our true nature and to love yes. one another. Absolutely. And this was what Makua said to us. Keep this in mind, he said, and have that be what helps guide you and inform your teaching and your relationships. And uh, it's, it's pertinent information for all of us to keep close and reflect on, especially during these challenging times. Yes, especially during these challenging times. Jill Kirkendall, we are out of time now, but I want mm. to thank you for joining me today. We haven't had nearly as much time as I would have liked to have spent with you um, <laughs> talking about, you know, Hank and your life together. Um mm. You know, there's so much more to talk about, but thank you for keeping the website up. Thank you for keeping his work available to everybody. Your work, too. Um, yes, thanks, Sandy. I, I really enjoyed having this time sharing information back and forth with you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, I'm sure everybody who knew you and Hank, their hearts go out to you in your loss and everybody else's loss. The world's yes, lost, indeed. but he's yes, not gone. Indeed. He's not gone. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jill. And if mm -hmm. anybody wants to check um, 
Hank's paintings, do go over to sharedwisdompaintings.com. They really are quite stunning, quite something. Um, and you can find lots of information, articles, uh, courses, uh, CDs, etc. at sharedwisdom.com. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you can find more information about um, the No BS Spiritual Book Club and my weekly live streaming interviews at sedgebeer.com. And I'll be back with you again at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>